So a dermatophyte is basically a fungal infection involving superficial areas. So if you've got a deep fungal infection, we don't call it a dermatophyte. So this includes the hair, skin, and nails. Um, dermatophytes break down keratin as a source of nitrogen, and they're incapable of penetrating subcutaneous tissue. So if you feel like something is a subcutaneous lesion, meaning it's more firm, it's not so scaly, it's probably not a dermatophyte. Cutaneous infections are referred to as tinea, categorized by body part infected, and you can see the list here. Corpus for the body, pruris for the groin, capitis for the head, barbe for the beard, manuum for the hand, pedis for feet, and unguium for nails. The genera of dermatophytes. <laughs> Trichophyte and microsporum and epidermophyte. And so you probably don't need to know much with this. Um, sometimes it has to do with treatment. Uh, trichophyte is the most common one in skin, hair, and nails. So that's the one you'll come up uh, with the most widely distributed and most important cause of infection in hair, skin, and nails. Uh, KOH prep, I do these every day. Um, it's the best way to find out if there is a dermatophyte or a tinea infection. So typically you can clean the skin with alcohol and I'll take a 15 blade like this. You can take a, you know, a disposable one um, or just take just the blade. It's cheaper to just take the blade. And you collect the scale with the angled belly of a 15 blade scalpel. You're basically just scraping on it. And sometimes you scrape hard enough to make them bleed, and I think that's a good specimen. Uh, put the scale in the center of a glass slide, as shown below there. And you add a drop of KOH, which is potassium hydroxide, and use a cover slip. And then you can heat it gently with a flame, so just get a lighter and run it under the uh, plate. That dissolves the keratin, so you'll see the high feet. Uh, which is what the fungus is. You'll see it bloom a little bit easier under the microscope. So that's the way I typically can tell if it's you know, dermatitis or just skin inflammation versus a fungus. Um, fungal cultures are typically, if you still suspect a fungus and your potassium hydroxide prep is negative, um, there's ways, you, you can do this a couple different ways. You can either pluck a hair and send it in with saline um, you can take a punch biopsy of the lesion and send that in with saline. Sometimes with nails, if I, I don't really like to treat fungal nails, but if, most of the time people come in and they're like, my nails look terrible. Well, it's probably just because you have bad nails. So if I want to make sure that they don't have a fungal infection in their nails, I'll clip their nail and I'll just send it in dry in a specimen cup and make them culture it out. Um, so it finds out the source of infection like an animal. Uh, or it selects the most suitable treatment. So if it comes back growing a specific type of fungus, you can tell which type of uh, antifungal you use. So the diagnostic features in the potassium hydroxide exam from this infected hair, does this have a, is this a pointer in it? No. So you see the little circles on that slide and the little tubes? Um, that's what we call a spaghetti meatballs pattern, <laughs> and that's hyphae or pseudo hyphae. Um, so if you see any little tubes, it's mostly those long tubes that you'll see, which is hyphae, and sometimes you'll see those little dots, and that's just the buds of the hyphae. Um, so what you're saying here, set tape hyphae with parallel walls throughout the entire length. So see where the arrow is, those those long tubes. That's hyphae, and that's how you tell in a KOH prep whether it's uh, positive or not. The limitations, sometimes the samples are too small or taken from an area where there is no fungus. And the one we come up with a lot, because most of the time, anytime somebody thinks, oh, I've got a fungus or ringworm, they'll go to the store and they'll get Lovetrin or Lamisil or something. And so they'll have already treated it or pseudo-treated it with some sort of topical antifungal. And so then it makes it harder to do a KOH prep. So sometimes it produces a false negative. Uh, false negative results are more common with KOH exam than fungal culture. So it takes a while, um, you know, you've got to be really patient too when you're looking at the scales to see if there's uh, fungus or not, but I use mine every day. Uh, tinea capitis is the first type of tinea infection we'll talk about, and it's a dermatophytosis of the scalp and associated hair, common in African American children. Honestly, it's just common in kids, period. Um, spread through direct contact with animals, humans, and fomites. Can anybody tell me what a fomite is? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of nothing, isn't it? Uh, fomite transmission is via shared hairbrushes, combs, caps, helmets, pillows, and other inanimate objects, which may have spores with the potential to spread infection. <clears throat> 
majority of cases in the United States is by the trichophyton, human-human uh, -human or fomite to human. That's why um, kids that, you know, wear a helmet or whatever, they've got fungus, and the friend wears a helmet, they can get tinea cavitis. Uh, worldwide causes the microsporum, which is animal to human. It can be non-inflammatory, which is what we see the black dot variant of, and then inflammatory is a carry-on or a combination of both. Broken hairs are a prominent feature. That's a big deal because if you see just slick bald areas, if like you're looking at their scalp with like a magnifying glass and it's slick and you cannot see a hair follicle, it's not to me. You're going to see broken hairs or even a hair follicle opening. And a lot of times they'll come with uh, posterior, posterior cervical or occipital lymphadenopathy. So if you find cervical lymphadenopathy and you suspect tinea cavitis, it's probably tinea cavitis. Um, the one, the picture on the right is the black dot hair loss. So that's a fungus, more likely than like alopecia or just baldness. This is normal hair. And the bricks of the hair. Um, KOH prep showing hair shaft and baldness. See those little bitty dots on the right side in the hair shaft? That is hyphae. Again, high feet and spores. So the circles are spores, the blue strands or the tubes are high feet. I don't have to be cooking, so whatever. KOH is good enough. Um, this is a carry on. It's a painful, inflammatory, boggy mass with broken hair follicles caused by untreated tinea. It can have areas of discharging pus frequently confused with a bacterial infection, although you can get a secondary bacterial infection, so sometimes you have to treat it with not only the antifungal, but also an antibiotic. Carrion carries a higher risk of scarring than other forms of tinea cavitis. Treatment, topical agents are ineffective. It's not gonna do anything. So even though they might have put on a topical antibiotic or the pediatrician that sent them over there, the topical antibiotic, you've gotta treat them with orals. Greasyofulvin is the drug of choice, but I use Lamisil a lot and that treats it just as good. The only limitation to oral Lamisil with kids is a pill. Um, children are often, often under-treated. Typically we tell them to take it with a fatty meal, which is pretty easy in kids with your chicken nuggets and cheeseburgers. It's just better absorbed that way. Um, and you treat it until there's no visual evidence plus two weeks. So it's typically about six to 12 weeks of treatment. Um, it has less risk of side effects than the Lamisil, like on the liver and stuff, so it is a good one. So now we'll move on to tinea pedis. The basics is it's athlete's foot. I have athlete's foot. So it's the most common fungal infection in developed countries, typically caused by trichophyton rubrum. Thrives in warm, moist environments like shoes and socks. Public showers, gyms, are common sources of infections. Good foot hygiene may reduce recurrences. I don't even know what that means. I guess that means wearing flip flops in the shower. Good foot hygiene. Keep your nails trimmed. Um, clinical patterns of infection interdigital between the toes. Moccasin, which it looks like a shoe is on your foot, and the vesicular bolus type. So here's the interdigital type, and it's the most common. It presents with scaling and redness between the toes and the maceration. Maceration just looks like pruny skin, basically. And so that's what it looks like, uh, interdigital type. This is the moccasin type. Uh, chronic hyperkeratotic type is also what it's known as. It's sharply demarcated, as you can see, there's that cut off on the foot, on that top picture. It's pretty, pretty robust. Um, and it's distributed along lateral borders of feet, heels, and soles, and it's associated with onychomycosis, which is the fungal infection of nails. So typically, if you see it on their nails, look at their feet, too, or vice versa, look at their feet, look at their nails, because sometimes they'll get recurring uh, tinea pedis because their nails haven't been treated. And nails are a lot harder to treat. <coughs> Um, sometimes this can be known as this moccasin type can be one hand, two feet. Somebody will come in and they'll say, I've got an athlete's foot, so always look at the other foot. I don't care if they say, well, I don't have anything on that foot. Tell them to take off their shoe and sock and look at their other foot. Then look at their hands, because most of the time we'll have one hand, two feet. But more often than not, it's both hands or just both feet. Um, so the affected hand usually shows unilateral fine scaling in the creases. If you see a hand like this, look at the feet as well. Sometimes they're just coming out. I've got a scaly hand. I'm okay, at the feet. I get an attitude. 
Um, the other type is the vesicular bolus type of tinea, and there's uh, the lesions are grouped, two, three millimeter vesicles, often on the arch or the instep, that's the instep of the foot. Might be itchy or painful, and there's typically scale on the sole. It's a delayed hypersensitivity uh, immune response to it. <coughs> that's why it's vesicular bolus and not just scaly. These are other types of tinea pedis, moccasin, intervisual, and vesicular. Oh, here we go. Hygiene. This is the foot hygiene. I didn't know what they meant with that. Uh, hygiene and topical antifungals are effective therapies. So hygiene, dry the area after bathing. Change socks daily and alternate shoes worn. Consider wearing open shoes such as sandals. Not Crocs. Oh. <laughs> People that have had Crocs for six years, throw them away. Put them in a bleach bucket. I don't care. Uh, also, you can use antifungal foot powder, like the Lamisil powder, um, to keep your feet dry. I had a man come in, and he was this old, cute little man, and I loved him. He was like, my feet are itchy, and they were always itchy. <laughs> and I mean, we treated his feet forever. And finally, by like the sixth visit, I look at his shoes and I go, Gerald, how long have you had those shoes? And he goes, well, hon, these are my gardening shoes. I've had them for nine years. I said, throw them away. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you spray in those shoes. It doesn't matter if you throw them in the washing machine. That is where it's coming from. And sure as heck, you threw them away and it went away. So tell them to throw their food away. <laughs> Uh, topical treatments are the imidazoles, which are fungus static, meaning they stop the fungus from growing. That's clotrinazole, myconazole, econazole, any azole is going to treat um, tinea pedis. Also, the alilamines are fungicidal, meaning that they're going to kill the fungus. Terbinafine, which is lamicil, sorry, naphthophene, and uh, butenafine. The alilamines have better sustained cure rates than imidazoles that are often more expensive. Uh, but Lamisil is cheap now. Uh, when to refer? Tinea pedis, corporis, or cruis that has failed to respond to hygiene changes, amidazole and alilamine therapy, large body surfaces area, and involved <coughs> in atypical areas of the body may indicate alternative diagnosis. Think somebody that's immunocompromised. This includes HIV patients, uh, people that are going through chemo, um, people that have graft versus host disease, anybody like that. That's when you refer. Corporis or body fungus. This is when people come in and say, I got ringworm. And you say, Yeah, you've got a fungus. And they go, I thought it was a ringworm. <laughs> you know, like it's the same thing. <laughs> Dermatophytosis in the skin affecting the trunk and the limbs. It's typically itchy. Sometimes they're not itchy at all. And that makes me think that they don't have eczema or something. Uh, the margin of the lesion is most active and the central area tends to heal. So that border, that annular border, that circular border will be real scaly and then the center will just be like normal skin. Scrapings should be taken from the red scaly margin for a KOH exam. If you do it in the center, you're not going to get any scale and you're not going to get any active fungus or hyphae. A variant of this tinea curris or jock is, there you go, another one, uh, curris, uh, has a similar presentation that appears in the drawing. Uh, check the bottom of your feet for tinea pedis. Uh, here's a picture, a very obvious tinea corpus. Annular lesion, the central clearing is typical of tinea corpus. More examples. You see, sometimes it can be really, really subtle. Um, sometimes the center looks a little like chemified or looks like it's just been scratched like crazy. Um, it might be a little bit pink. Tinea cruris is a dramatic, dramatified infection of the groin called tinea cruris jock itch. They, but people, the guys will come in and they'll say, I have jock itch, and it's not jock itch. It's, you know, a type of eczema or something. So uh, that's why we can do scrapings around that scale. It may lack the scale, though, because of the scrotal occlusion, so it'll be more macerated in that area. So then you look at other, other areas if you suspect tinea cruris. You look at the hands, the feet, the scalp, uh, the nails. Treatment, topical antifungals are applied until tinea shows resolution and continue treatment for a minimum of two weeks. So it's typically a four to six week treatment. Again, the imidazoles and the alilamines are great for tinea corporis. Oral antifungals are indicated if they have a, a poor response to topical agents. An animal is suspected as a source of infection or large surface areas involved. Typically, I don't have to give them this. I didn't know that about the animal. 
jungle culture can help guide therapy and terbinafine is the drug of choice, which is Lamisil. Tinea unguium, don't those look lovely? Lovely nails. Onychomycosis is the more common term we use. Chronic fungal infection of the nail bed. Uh, dermato infection, dermato, that's just repetitive. So, tinea unguium is a dermatophyte infection of the nail bed. Typically starts as tinea pedis, responds very poorly to topical antifungals. There are two out there now that are lacquers that we've been using that we've had some really great responses to, but you have to use it for 48 weeks, which is almost a year, because it takes about 12 months to grow a new toenail and 9 to 10 months to grow a new fingernail. But typically I do a culture and I put them on something oral. Um, the most common type of onychomycosis is distal subungual onychomycosis. Their nail will be thickened, there will be subungual or under the nail debris and separation of the nail plate from the nail bed. The nail bed is the skin that plays on. And it's typically caused by trichophyte rubin, which also causes tinea pedis. Um, they can also have what's called superficial white onychomycosis, which just looks like little white specks on their nails. It's less common and may respond to the topical therapy. Proximal subungual onychomycosis may herald immunosuppression. I've never seen this. Have you ever seen I haven't either, but that's one of those things with the HIV that we want. I said don't worry about. Um, but I've never actually seen that. So this is the distal subungual onychomycosis, which is the most common presentation of fungus. And it, not every nail is involved. If you ever see anybody that has all their toenails involved and all their fingernails involved, you've got to think about something else going on because it's typically not from fungus. A uh, confirmation fungus and the affected nail is necessary before oral antifungal treatment. It can mimic other conditions like psoriasis, which we'll talk about tomorrow, and another condition we call lichen planus, which I've seen more often than not. Uh, methods for confirming the fungus, uh, a culture is preferred because it can identify the organism, and that can help direct therapy. So that's when we were talking about like clipping the nail, if you could, and sending it in a specimen cup. You can also try to do a KOH exam. Um, a curette is a little instrument that we use in dermatology that looks like a loop. It's got a sharp end and a blunt end, and we use that for various procedures. One of them you can use to get the scale off of the toenail into a cup. So if you can get some of that subungual debris with the nail, that's awesome. Nail clippings are what I do more often than not. I don't do nail biopsies. That's hard and painful. Um, and then you can send out for a histologic exam. The problem with, the only problem really with the nail uh, uh, fungal culture, it takes a month for all that to grow out for a final result. So you have to kind of let the patient know, listen, the nails are going to be like this for a while until I can tell exactly what kind of fungus it is because it takes a long time to grow out that uh, culture. So uh, for the distal subungual onychomycosis treatment, first line is terbinafine or lamisil, 250 milligrams daily for 12 weeks for the toenails, 6 weeks for the fingernails. <coughs> so the risks involved can be idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity, reversal taste disturbance that I have not seen, drug interactions because of the P450, CYPT, inhibitor, and skin reactions. Um, what we really come up with mostly is the hepatotoxicity. So if they drink alcohol, they've got cirrhosis, you've got to be really careful putting them on this. They may just have to live with it. Uh, counsel the patients on risks and monitor their LFTs. So a lot of times what I'll do before I put them on uh, Lamisil, I'll get a baseline LFT and I might check them, you know, in the treatment, maybe half the treatment. Uh, if their liver function looks fine when they start, I typically don't check it again. Um, but if it looks kind of bad at the beginning, I might check it at the end of treatment. Um, do not begin treatment without confirmation of fungus on culture KOH histologic exam. I think that's a PML thing. I think that that's, that she has to have that culture before she'll treat it. Um, clinical cure is only seen in about 50% of patients, so treatment failure is a significant risk. It works well, but again, there's, there's some of these new topicals out there that work really good. And again, throw away your shoes, and we'll stop getting it so much. So when to refer, nail dystrophy that is negative on multiple fungal cultures and on histology, uh, only half of nail dystrophy is caused by fungus. So people that come in and they say, I've got nail fungus, some of the times, 50% of the times, it's not fungus. And you'll argue with them, and they think that's what it is, and they'll tell you when they got it. They went to the, the 
pedicurist, and that's where she got it, and she's not going to go back there and, you know, whatever. Anyway, they take their own tools to the pedicure lady. These are mine, and they put them in a little bag. Stella had a hard week. So, uh, patterns of nail dystrophy is not typical for fungal infection, especially if other rashes are present. That's why it's good to look at the whole patient. If they have it on their nails, look everywhere else. Look at those places like their pits, their hands, their feet, their groin. Uh, culture positive onychomycosis that fails compliant first line therapy. Sometimes people will have what this guy has, which is lichen planus and they'll have subsequent onychomycosis because the nail bed is traumatized. So, yeah, you might have a culture-positive onychomycosis, but you are treating the heck out of it with Lamisil, Lamisil, Lamisil. You can even put them on a medication called Itraconazole, which is really the big gun for this, and they still don't get any better. It's because they've got this underlying inflammatory nail disease. So that's when you refer <coughs> to them. Send them to me. Uh, the next one is tinea versicolor, which I'm sure we've all had, especially when we were in college. Uh, it's also called pityriasis versicolor. It's not caused by a dermatophyte. Its colonization is caused by malassezia, which is a lipophilic yeast, so different than a fungus. And it's a normal resident of the keratin the skin, so everybody has this on their skin. Um, and it's typically present in puberty and beyond. It tends to recur annually in the summer months. I think that it mostly occurs in the summer because we're sweating a lot more, we're more hot, but also because we're tanner and you can see a little bit more. Um, it's characterized by well demarcated tan, salmon, or hypopigmented, hyperpigmented patches occurring most commonly on the trunk and arms. The macules will grow, coalesce, and various shapes and sizes are attained in the asymmetric distribution. Visible scale is not often present, but when rubbed with a finger, scalpel blade scale is readily seen. The diagnostic feature of tinea versicolor um, and the above scale will disappear after treatment. So this is not a very good picture. Um, I don't know if anybody else has had this before, but you'll notice that you have like these white patches on your trunk and your arms and your back, and it'll look kind of scaly, and people don't like the way it looks, and it's worse in the summer because they're tan everywhere but those patches. So, so that's a more dark skin than you can see, probably. Um, it's called Versicolor because it can be light, dark, or pink to tan. So in untanned Caucasians, the lesions may be salmon, colored, or brown. In tanned Caucasians, the lesions may appear pale in comparison to the surrounding skin. In darker skin individuals, the lesions can be hyper or hypopigmented. Um, so see, there's the light spots, there's dark spots, and there's pink or tan spots. Those are good. Those are better computers. Um, microscopy or KOH. So this is this is kind of what they showed at the beginning, that spaghetti and meatballs appearance. So those little bitty dots are the pseudohyphae, and then those tubes are the hyphae. So spaghetti and meatballs. And I, every time I scrape somebody with any other color, you can see it very easily. So the KOH exam shows short hyphae and small round spores, characteristic spaghetti and meatball pattern. Short hyphae, spores. Microscopy would die added to the specimen. That's a nice one. It's a really nice one. Topical treatment is first line. You cannot do oral treatment anymore. I'll tell you why. So, shampoos. Uh, selenium sulfide, 2% shampoo, that's basically just head and shoulders. Ketoconazole shampoo, I think, works way better. Zinc. Um, it works pretty good. I like to use the zinc shampoo if they have they get it chronically as like kind of a maintenance treatment, but the all shampoo is really good and it's over the counter too. Um, you apply it daily to the affected areas, wait two minutes and rinse off. So you basically tell them to get it kind of rubbed into their skin and stand there naked before they get in the shower for about 10 to 20 minutes. You can get in, rinse it off. Um, do it every day for about one to four weeks and it's just as effective as oral therapy. Yeah, I like to be on the top of it too. Typically, they've already tried that. Um, the imidazole creams like ketoconazole and clotrimazole, I don't think clotrimazole works as well, but it is an option. Ketoconazole, um, there's a lot of different formulations. There's creams, there's gels, there's foams, and so that's really nice. I like the foam the best because it's easier to spread on. And I have them do it 
twice a day for one to four weeks. Um, it's very effective for limited areas, and it can be more expensive than shampoos. Um, you can also use uh, Lamisil spray, and it works really good too. Maintenance therapy, most of the time they relapse. Most of the time they'll come and say, I get this every summer. Um, if more than one previous episode, recommend maintenance therapy. But make sure that that's what it is. I've had people come in and they're always like, oh, my skin cancer's back, I need some of that foam again. And then we find out it's something completely different. So if I don't do a scraping, I don't know for sure if that's what it is. Um, a lot of times once they get rid of it, I'll have them still use that shampoo. That's where that zinc comes in. But I'll have them just use that shampoo on their body maybe you know, twice a week just to kind of keep it at bay. And again, you leave it on for about 10 minutes before you rinse it off. Intertrigo. This isn't really fungus, so I don't know why this is in this section. But basic facts, it's inflammation of large skin fold. So inframammary, gluteal, and inguinal creases, and under a big old belly. Those are the folds. Up to 10% is complicated by candida. So you can typically people go, oh, I got fungus. And if it doesn't have the typical characteristics that we'll talk about with candida, then it's just inner trigo. So it burns more than it itches. Uh, a lot of times if they have candida, they'll have the satellite macules, papules, and pustules around the redness. KOH exam may reveal pseudohyphae, but fungal culture is more sensitive for candida. So I don't typically scrape these. I typically um, can either tell quickly or I'll do a little biopsy. So those are the satellite uh, papules and candida. If you don't know, then you can do a fungal culture. So management is prevention, which is incredibly difficult, especially in larger individuals, especially in these older ladies that refuse to wear a bra, and they've got the biggest breasts you've ever seen. <laughs> and this is what they'll do. Well, I keep these washcloths under here. And I'm like, just get a bra. You don't have to get a fancy one. Just get a bra. <laughs> I mean, I just don't get it. I don't want to wear a bra. So keep the areas dry clean and cool. Oh, oh, and then I got this one lady, and she swears she dries with her hair dry under her boobs every day, and she swears that keeps it away. So hey, so here you go. Dry areas after bathing with hair dryer on a cool setting. Do it twice a day. Encourage weight loss for obese patients. Wear loose clothing made of cotton. So here's candidal intertrigo management. The imidazoles like myconazole, clitrum, uh, clitrimazole, and econazole. Um, you can also treat dermatophytes in case you're not sure. Um, nystatin is a great uh, treatment. It only works for candida. So if you think it's just candida, not dermatophytes, nystatin is great. The allylamines, terbenafine, and naphthine are not effective for candida. So, you know, I love this ketoconazole, econazole, and nystatin. Those are all really great ones if you're just thinking candida. It's really hard to get candida, though. <coughs> um, Severate dermatitis, did you guys ever do severate dermatitis? No, but I, I plan to if you will. I don't know. Yeah, I'll do it. Very, this guy's got severate dermatitis. Very common inflammatory reaction to the malassezia yeast. That was the one that also causes um, tinea versicolor, color, um, and it thrives on seborrheic skin. So any oily, oil-producing skin, which you'll see on the face, the scalp, high areas of sebum production. And it's an inflammatory reaction to normal flora. Also, some people think it's an overgrowth, maybe, of the malassezia, and that's what's causing the scale. It's a chronic condition that can be controlled, not cured. It's very important to tell your patients because they'll get mad at you if it comes back. Uh, it typically presents as erythematous scaling patches on the scalp, hairline, eyebrows, eyelids, central face, nasolabial folds, which are right here, very common area for it the external auditory canals, and the central crest. Separate dermatitis is often worse in patients with HIV and Parkinson's. I had a patient come in with HIV and had it horribly. Um, so she's got a little bit on her forehead. That's not a really great case, but that's a really bad case of the ear. And um, it's often hypopigmented in darker skin types. Favors the central crest, the central crest. Uh, Erythematous hypopigmented, uh, it's partially treated, it can be just a few little capsules.
Typically, I use a topical ketoconazole cream twice daily, which reduces the yeast counts. You can also use a low potency topical steroid for flares twice a day for about one or two weeks. Uh, the anti dandruff shampoo, again, sometimes I'll have people use ketoconazole shampoo to their scalp. It's so easy. Um, I'll leave it on for 10 minutes, rinse, repeat it every uh, few days or so. So, take home points. <laughs> I always, if I ever suspect tinea, I do a KOH prep. It's so easy. If you've got access to a 15 blade and a microscope, which is, it's easy to do. And it honestly, yeah, it takes a trained eye, but honestly, we've all had science in this class. We know how to look under a microscope. If you look at enough specimens, even if you don't think it is, look at enough normal specimens and you'll be able to see a really good positive one. Um, so if you still suspect it's a fungus, even after a KOH is negative, humble cultures are the way to go. Um, treat tinea capitis beyond clinical clearance in kids. I just ran into this not too long ago with a kid. Um, we need to be treating longer, so we're kind of starting over again. If they have candidal inner trigo, look for satellite macules, papules, or pustules at the perimeter of the erythema. And a lot of times, if they've got true candida in the inner trigenous areas, it's going to be bright, beefy red, like you think with like diaper dermatitis. Um, if you have, if somebody comes in with one hand scaling and itching, look at their feet, because a lot of times they'll have that one hand, two foot thing. I think that's a board's question. One hand, two feet. Tinea versicolor is a misnomer. It's not tinea, it's an alicesia for fur, and it recurs. So that's it. I ran through that really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? No? Yes.